Hello world of YouTube. I'm here to make a very detailed video about my journey with an eight month long yeast infection. So, just as a warning, I'm not a professional medical doctor, I'm not a gynecologist, an OBGYN, I'm not even a nurse or a nurse practitioner. I'm just someone who used the internet to inform myself, but I also talked to uh, nurse practitioners and my gynecologist, and so this video represents um, my collection of information based on my own personal research, but also what I have uh, gathered from several conversations with different nurses, nurse practitioners, and my gynecologist. First of all, let's go over the differences between a yeast infection and some other types of vaginal infections. If you're not sure if you have a yeast infection or not, I highly recommend purchasing this, the Monistat Complete Care Vaginal Health Test. I got this at Walmart for about 15 bucks and it was worth every penny. It comes with two swabs, right, and the swab is testing for abnormal acidity in your vagina. So your vagina has a slightly acidic pH. That's its healthy environment. If it has a bacterial infection, the bacterial infection will affect the acidity, which will come up on the test. And I really like this test because it's very clear, it's very informative. It even includes lots of information about the possible infections that you may have. So, a yeast infection is a fungal infection. It will, it should not affect the pH of your vagina. So, if you're experiencing symptoms like thick, clumpy discharge and itchiness and discomfort, and you use the swab, um, you test your vagina and it comes out normal or the swab is not affected and the color doesn't change, chances are you have a yeast infection, of course. Go to your doctor, go to your gynecologist and make sure they take a culture and they test you as well. Bacterial vaginosis, however, will affect the pH and the swab will come out uh, slightly discolored, like here. Now, there's also an STD, uh, trichomoniasis. Wait, trichomoniasis. This can also cause itching, burning, and irritation, and a musty or an unpleasant um, smell, and frothy yellow-green vaginal discharge. So, bacterial vaginosis in general is not an STD but trichomoniasis is. And again, um, after using this home test, I highly suggest going to your doctor and having them test you and figuring everything out. And in general, just do an STD test every once in a while, especially if you're not in a monogamous relationship because that's always a good idea. So go get tested. Okay. So those are the differences between a yeast infection and a more bacterial infection. Yeast infection should not cause an unpleasant smell, and that's usually the clue that you have a yeast infection and not something else. So, what are the principal causes of yeast infection? Trapped moisture, so wearing tight clothing, wearing silk um, underwear, or underwear that's not made of natural breathable fibers. Right, so I would avoid wearing silk underwear, I would avoid wearing thongs, I would just wear breathable, clear cotton granny panties. They may not be sexy, but if it means I won't get another yeast infection, I'm willing to do it. Number two, scented soaps, douching, and detergents. Um, in general, I would avoid using soap anywhere near my vagina. The vagina is designed to clean itself that's why we have vaginal discharge. Uh, if you're worried about how it smells, 
just remember that we live in a patriarchal society and that society teaches us to be insecure about our bodies and that includes our vaginas. We have to worry about, is it tight enough? Does it look cute? Is, it, is my skin too dark? Uh, is it too hairy? Is it not hairy enough? Does it smell? Like all of these worries were taught and you should just free yourself from them. The vagina is a vagina and therefore it's supposed to smell like a vagina. And if you notice an extreme change in the way that your vagina smells, it could be a sign of a bacterial infection. So I would go to your doctor and um, have them take a look at it. And uh, it might be just a simple um, problem of bacteria and you take an antibiotic and that is that. So don't use scented soaps. Even the hippie kind of soaps that have tea tree oil or peppermint oil in them, like the, uh, the Castile soaps, avoid any contact with those soaps um, around your vagina because those can cause an infection. Um, and don't douche. Don't use douches. They're just a bad idea, like the Summer's Eve products. Just don't do it. You don't need it. You don't need it and they're just using those products you're just asking for an infection so avoid contact with scented soaps douches and detergents and that includes laundry detergent uh, another um, frequent cause is your diet if your diet is high in processed sugars and white flour and white rice and simple carbohydrates those simple carbohydrates and sugars are just feeding the yeast. So in general, it's good to keep those in check and try to eliminate those from your diet within reason as much as possible. Uh, number four, birth control pills. And in this category, I'm including both hormonal birth control as well as um, condoms. So for her hormonal birth control pills, or well, the pill, the arm implant, um, interuterine de devices that use hormones, uh, it's pretty well known that they can cause um, or lead to yeast infections because of how they affect your natural hormonal balances. But condoms, you may have a slight latex allergy or sensitivity to latex, so that could cause irritation that can lead to a yeast infection. Um, and especially condoms with spermicide. I know spermicide adds that extra layer of protection, but the spermicide, especially um, prolonged contact to the spermicide, so if you, every time you have sex, you use condoms and spermicide, that spermicide can um, damage the cell walls of the vagina, and over time that can lead to irritation and then infections. So. Condoms and spermicide are good for one night stands or if you're not in a monogamous relationship, but if you are in a monogamous relationship and you use condoms, I would avoid the spermicide. Number five, hormonal imbalances. This could be an excess of estrogen. This could be related to the hormonal birth control that you might be using. Um, it could also be related to any thyroid issues and your thyroid in general is a gland that's right here um, and if you have hypo or hyperthyroidism this can affect so many things or in your body so if you have any uh, family history of thyroid issues like I do um, I would suggest go uh, go to your doctor and get a blood test because that's really the only way that they can tell if you have hyper or hypothyroidism um, and they can also check your estrogen levels and things like that. Number six, pregnancy. Pregnancy, especially early pregnancy, your hormones are all out of whack. Oftentimes, a yeast infection right after conception can be an early sign of pregnancy. So yeah, just pregnancy can be um, a cause of yeast infection. Number seven, diabetes. And this goes along the lines of diet that I was mentioning earlier. Um, spikes in blood sugar can promote the growth of yeast and that yeast can take over uh, and cause an imbalance in your, in your vaginal environment. 
So if you're diabetic, you are more prone to uh, yeast infection. And number eight, stress. Because stress releases cortisol and all these stress hormones, which can affect other hormonal balances and imbalances in the body and just lead to so many health problems, not just yeast infections. So um, dealing with stress in a healthy way is really important. What if you are suffering from recurring or frequent yeast infections, meaning that you get more than one or two yeast infections a year? What if you get three or four? Or if you're like me, what if you've had a fucking yeast infection for eight months? What do you do or what is causing that? One cause is uh, a weak immune system. And when I mean weak, I mean um, if you are HIV positive or if you have some other autoimmune disease or condition that can cause a weak immune system. So that can be um, a cause of recurring yeast infections. Now, if you're not sure if you're HIV positive, um, of course, go get tested. Like I said earlier, it's always good to get tested uh, once or twice a year. Now, if you know for sure you're not HIV positive or you know for sure you don't have any autoimmune diseases or deficiencies, what could be the cause? So after lots of research, I finally found some answers. <laughs> so the, there's different types of yeast, different species of yeast. The most common type of yeast that's going to cause the typical yeast infection and when I mean typical, I mean the yeast infection that will easily be cured through over-the-counter or home remedies is called Candida albicans, and I'll include it here. So the typical yeast infection is caused by this type of um, yeast or Candida, and anything from monostat to home remedies or the prescriptive pill called um, Diflucan should clear it up. Now, there are other species of yeast. Um, the most common being, or the second most common being, Candida glabrata, written here. These other species of yeast are not, or they are resistant to the family of drugs called imidazoles. Imidazoles are antifungal drugs. Diflucan, the pill, which I have an example here. Diflucan is also called fluconazole. Um, monostat is an imidazole drug. Um, Lotrimin is also an imidazole drug. So all of these ant typical antifungal drugs are in that imidazole family. So Candida glabrata is resistant to these, this family of drugs. So of course, monostat is not going to help with an infection caused by Candida glabrata or other species of Candida. So yeah, so these other species of Candida are resistant to the typical over-the-counter, but even typical prescription drug, um, drugs that are used to treat yeast infections. And there is more and more research showing that Candida albicans, the most common typical strand of, of yeast, is growing a resistance to these drugs as well. So. If you have frequent or recurring yeast infections and you know for sure you are not HIV positive and you do not have any immune deficiency issues, chances are you have a drug resistant strand of candida. And I think that's what happened to me. So, what can you do to prevent a yeast infection? First, keep your vagina dry. Like I said earlier, just wear plain cotton breathable underwear, avoid tight clothes, 
And when you get out of the shower, don't get dressed immediately after you dry yourself off. If you can, if you have time in the morning. <laughs> Give yourself a few minutes, five or 10 minutes even, just to let your vagina air dry. Make sure all of that humidity and moisture is evaporating off before you cover her up with underwear and clothing. Another good idea is just sleep naked. I sleep naked every night that I'm not on my period. Again, if you are in a relationship and your partner spends nights with you, your partner is definitely going to enjoy this. <laughs> they will not mind, I promise. Um, but sleeping naked just allows the vagina to breathe and not be covered up and covered in moisture all day. So keep her dry. A second thing is keeping her clean and this does not involve using soap or douches, so don't do that. Just, you, just rinse her off with water in the shower, dry her off, make sure you use clean towels and that you change your towels out often, and also that you clean your bedding often, especially if you are using or if you are sleeping naked at night. Third thing, avoid fake scents, and I mentioned this earlier. Um, I would recommend using, for your period, organic cotton, unbleached cotton tampons and pads, or just using a period cup, like a Diva cup or a Lunette cup. That's what I use for my period. I use the, D the Diva cup. I love it. It's easy to clean. It lasts for years. It's better for me and for the environment. Um, tampons and pads, or scented tampons and pads, can lead to yeast infections. And I know that the organic unbleached cotton tampons and pads cost more, like four or five dollars more per box than what you can get, you know, at Walmart or whatever. But I think that that extra four or five bucks is worth it, you know? When it comes to laundry detergent, I know everyone loves the scent of freshly clean clothes that smell like mountain wildflowers or clean linen or whatever, but those scents are fake. Okay, so like I was saying about using the organic tampons and pads, they may, um, more hippie natural laundry detergent might be a little bit more expensive, but if it means you're not going to suffer from recurring or frequent yeast infections, I think it's worth it. So. I know like the seventh generation brand is really expensive, but if you live near a Trader Joe's, for example, you can get their laundry detergent. It's pH balanced. There's no harsh petrochemicals. It does not pollute the environment. Um, and the only scent is natural lavender essential oil. That's it. So I would recommend the Trader Joe's liquid laundry detergent. It's good for high efficiency machines. It smells delicious. You can also look into hypoallergenic laundry detergents that do not have any scent or fake coloring at all. That would also be a good option. Number four, keep your vagina and yourself happy and healthy. So avoid those simple carbs and sugars, drink plenty of water, try to get as much sleep as possible, exercise, because um, exercise and getting a plenty of sleep and just taking care of yourself can help reduce that stress. So don't feel guilty for taking care of yourself. And taking care of yourself also means probiotics. So I know uh, probiotics are kind of like uh, a fashionable it thing when it comes to food commercials nowadays and there's lots of yogurts out there that say that they're full of probiotics and yogurt in general is full of probiotics however I would avoid fruit flavored yogurt fruit honey vanilla flavored yogurts I would just get plain yogurt because the flavored yogurt is just full of sugar and if you're trying to cut back on sugar so that it doesn't feed the yeast, but your yogurt is full of sugar, it's just, it's defeating the purpose. So um, the type of yogurt that I like to eat in the morning, and I mix it with a fruit salad every morning, 
is the Lifeway plain kefir yogurt. All right, not the flavored ones, even though it's they're delicious, but the plain yogurt does not have added sugar in it. And it has 12 strands of live active probiotic cultures, especially the three strands that you're looking for. Okay, there are three types of um, probiotic cultures that you really want to make sure you have in your probiotics, either in your yogurt or if you take probiotics like this one. You want Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, and Streptococcus thermophilus. And I'll have those written here. Those are the three types of probiotics that really are beneficial for a healthy vagina. And the last thing that you might want to look into as a preventative me measure is the type of birth control you're using. I know there are lots of women out there who depend on hormonal birth control because they have um, serious issues with their periods, they have abnormally painful periods, they have endometriosis, any of these other health issues. However, if you don't have those health issues, you might want to look into alternative forms of birth control because hormonal birth control, be it the pill or the arm implant or an IUD, um, long-term use of hormonal birth control can have some serious health effects. They can affect your liver enzymes, they can affect your bone density, and there's even some studies linking long-term use of hormonal birth control with things like breast cancer and other types of cancers. So, you might want to look into non-hormonal birth control. So this could be the copper IUD, um, but in my case, I don't take hormonal birth control. My partner and I, we just use condoms. Uh, we use non-spermicidal condoms, and we are currently looking into um, using non-latex condoms. So that could be an option. Condoms work great. They don't affect our sex lives at all, and they're a safer option. Um, they could be a safer option than hormonal birth control. So just something to look into. So what are some of the natural remedies that I've tried in my eight month long journey <laughs> with this yeast infection? Um, one natural remedy is using apple cider vinegar and salt and mixing that together in a warm bath and then sitting in the bath. So apple cider vinegar, it's one of these kind of fashionable, popular health food crazes, but it really is good for you. Um, there is the Bragg brand of apple cider vinegar that is organic, unfiltered, all that good stuff. The Trader Joe's brand is unfiltered and it's organic as well and it's cheaper. So that's what we get. So you take about a half cup of this and some salt, probably like a quarter to a half a cup of salt. You mix it in the bathtub with warm water and you sit. Um, I personally it did not cure my yeast infection, but it did relieve some of the itchiness and some of the symptoms. So that's one home remedy. Another remedy is oregano oil capsules. And after doing a little bit of research, I found out that oregano oil has powerful antibacterial and antifungal properties. So the idea is you take these capsules, these pills that you can get at stores like Whole Foods or Earth Fair or any health food store, and it's supposed to help kill the yeast from the inside out. Personally, it did not work for me. I took a whole bottle, and not at, not at once, but every day you take, you take like two or three pills throughout the day of oregano oil, and it's supposed to help, but for me, it didn't. My infection continued. So that might be something to look into. Um, garlic. Just taking a garlic clove, peeling it, and putting it up there, um, that is supposed to help as well. I have tried that in the past for previous yeast infections, 
and honestly I think it would it helps kind of control the yeast so that it doesn't overgrow too quickly but for me personally it never cured me of my yeast infection um, but if you're willing to try it I would recommend doing it overnight because once you put the garlic clove into your vagina you'll notice that your breath will start to smell like garlic or at least that's how it works for me <laughs> so something to look into as well now so far hands down the best home remedy that I've tried that has helped me to control my current yeast infection but unfortunately it was not strong enough to heal it or cure it is taking a tampon and soaking it in a mixture of coconut oil and tea tree oil. So if your coconut oil is solid, you just take a couple tablespoons, put it in a microwave safe container like a glass, microwave it for five to ten seconds just to make it into a liquid form. You add no more than three or four drops of tea tree oil Okay, probably you want to start off just using two or three drops because this is really potent stuff. Mix it up, take your tampon, soak your tampon in the coconut oil, tea tree oil mix for a few minutes and then insert it and you want to do this about twice a day and then you can leave one in overnight. That did have a significant impact on my yeast infection even to the point to where I thought I had cured it but then within a week I noticed it was starting to grow back. So I would say for the normal Candida albicans strand of, of uh, yeast infection, if you don't want to use Monistat or one of the over-the-counter treatments, and if you have some tea tree oil and coconut oil and a tampon handy, I would definitely recommend um, that remedy. And I think it would cure most yeast infections. As for the prescription and over-the-counter treatments that I've tried, of course I've tried Monistat, I've tried the one-day and the three-day Monistat several times. I also tried, just out of desperation, <laughs> these Azo pills. Um, they're supposed to help relieve symptoms of, uh, of a yeast infection and you just take one, you take one pill three times a day for as long as you have symptoms, but I got this at Walmart and honestly I didn't notice much of a difference, so I would not recommend this, but maybe, I mean, your body's different from mine, it might work for you. Now, when I went to um, my doctor the first time, she prescribed to me the Diflucan or Fluconazole pill, and that is the pill, it's only prescription, but you take the first pill, and if your yeast infection isn't cleared within three days, you take the second one. So normally you get two pills. Um, I have taken a total of five fluconazole slash diflucan pills, and my, my infection persists. Okay, so when the fluconazole didn't work, they prescribed clotrimazole, which is just uh, Lotrimin. So this is 2% Clotrimazole cream that you put in three nights in a row. And it's supposed to be stronger than the Monistat. And it's supposed to target um, drug resistant strands of yeast or types of yeast. So I did this treatment as well. Didn't work. So obviously I have a yeast infection caused by a species of yeast that is resistant to those imidazole um, drugs. So what can you do? My last resort and the treatment that I am trying right now is boric acid. Okay. Before I go into the details, let me give my bright flashy warning. If you're pregnant, 
do not use boric acid to treat a yeast infection. If you're trying to get pregnant, if you think you might be pregnant, don't use this because it can affect the fetus in some pretty bad ways. So don't use this if you're pregnant. Also, keep this out of reach from children and animals and do not eat this because large doses of boric acid can be deadly and they can cause some pretty serious kidney damage as well as damage to some other organs because if this comes, if you eat this or if it enters your bloodstream, it's very dangerous. However, using this as a vaginal suppository, it is very safe and it is a last resort for yeast infections that are resistant to typical over-the-counter or prescription drugs. So that is what I'm doing. I bought some empty gelatin capsules and I filled them myself and this is what I'm using as a suppository. But basically, you get size zero gelatin capsules and you fill them up. Just watch the video linked below to see how they're made. And you take one capsule each night you put it into your vagina before going to bed. And for severe long-term yeast infections, okay, so if you've had a yeast infection for like six months or more, like I have, I would do this for 14 nights in a row. For less severe or less frequent yeast infections, just do this seven nights in a row. And then as a follow-up for a few months, especially for severe yeast infections, insert one suppository twice a week for several months. So for example, my plan is I'm going to do the full 14 nights in a row and then I'm going to put one in on Monday night and another one in on Thursday night for the next four to six months. And after that, your yeast infection should be cured. So unfortunately, this isn't an overnight fix, but it will bring relief. So if you are desperate for a cure for a yeast infection after all other prescription and over-the-counter and home remedy, um, if you've tried it all and nothing has worked, then look into boric acid. I got this at Rite Aid for about six or seven bucks and I bought the empty capsules at a health food store. I got a hundred for five bucks so total I spent about eleven or twelve dollars and I will have enough materials to make lots and lots of, um, of these boric acid suppositories. You can look online and buy pre-made boric acid suppositories, but you're going to be paying between $15 and $20 for just like 30 or 40 capsules. Whereas if you just find the materials and make it yourself, you'll probably never have to buy boric acid ever again. <laughs> so that is what I'm doing. I hope this video helps anybody out there who's desperate for a solution for a very uncomfortable problem. Thank you for watching comment below, share your knowledge, and let me know if this solution works for you. Okay, bye!